Khajuraho, a living museum of art and architecture. The temples of love. Located in the Chhatarpur district of Madhya Pradesh, Khajuraho is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and considered to be one of the seven wonders of India. of 24 Jain and Hindu temples built around the 10th century. The temples are beautifully and intricately embellished and detailed. from around the world come here to visually indulge in the antiquity and the essence that permeates the whole place. The erotic art on the walls is the main allure of these temples. Chandela dynasty tradition. It has been a practice down the years to draw parallels between the erotic sculptures engraved on the walls of Kajuraho temples and the Kama Sutra, the Indian doctrine on lovemaking. Whether these stone carvings are portrayals from the Kama Sutra or not, they indeed are a revelation of life in India around the 10th century. These temples were built by Chandela rulers who reigned over central India between 950 AD and 1050 AD. It is said that Chandravarman, the founder of the Chandela dynasty, was born out of wedlock to a Brahmin girl and a moon god. He was brought up in the forests, away from the disapproving eyes of society. One night, King Chandravarman had a dream where his mother visited him. She implored to him to build temples that would depict human passion and bring about realization of the shallowness of worldly desires and hence started the Chandela dynasty's romance with art and architecture at Khajuraho. Tantraism Connection Most of the temples are built of sandstone in varying shades of buff, pink and pale yellow. The temples are divided into three geographical divisions, the Western Group, the Eastern Group and the Southern Group. The Western Group houses five large temples and several smaller ones. The Kandariya Mahadev Temple is the largest and most typical of Khajuraho temples in the Western group. The engravings on its walls are an embodiment of a highly mature civilization. 
The sensual sculptures of fine-grained sandstone are a portrayal of titillation and sexual explicitity. These temples talk of a civilization that celebrated love without inhibitions.
Tantraism believes that man can be one with God through physical and emotional union with a woman. The Tantric cult believes that stimulation of the erotic zones of the human body creates sensual feelings. These sensual feelings open up the body's capability of tuning in to higher frequencies of subtle bodies within. Thus, Tantraism maintains that gratification of earthly desires is a doorway to the divine. It probably explains why the outer walls of the Khajuraho temples are covered with depictions of copulating couples. Educational gallery for young men. As against popular belief, Khajuraho temples are not just about erotic art. Erotic scenes represent a relatively small part of the carvings. Though sensuous eroticism undeniably prevails in all the sculptures, the sculptures actually revel in the beauty of the human form. Each of the sculptures has a story to tell. It is said that in medieval times, when young men had completed their studies in the Gurukul, Indian residential school in ancient India, and were ready to progress in life before entering Grahasthashram or family life, they were brought here to receive education on the ways of life ahead. Khajuraho's Curious Survival Erotic art in Khajuraho could have offended subsequent dynasties. The temples could have been damaged by Muslim intruders under the pretext of being profane.
Yet, the temple complex stood the test of time and survived. When the Chandela dynasty declined after the 13th century, Kajuraho was also forgotten in the surrounding forest cover due to its rather unassuming location. Kajuraho temples lay safely hidden in the forests for centuries until one day in the 19th century a Palkiwala, a sedan carrier, slipped out the information to British Army engineer Captain T.S. Burt. In 1838, the temples were rediscovered and preserved. However, by the time the temples were rediscovered, 61 had been lost due to the ravages of time and nature. All the Buddhist temples were lost. Magnificent architecture. Of the 85, now only 24 exist in their revived glory. The basic layout of most Khajuraho temples is identical. with graded peaks reminiscent of Mount Kailash. Small or large, the roofs of all the temples rise majestically from the lowest over the Ardha Mandapa entrance port to the tallest over the Sanctum Sanctorum. All the temples have rooms inside that are interconnected and located either in the east or west segment. The entrance to all temples is through the Ardha Mandapa entrance porch that leads to the Mandapa assembly hall. the Antarala vestibule that is the threshold to the Garbhagraha, the Sanctum Sanctorum. Here the cult image is enshrined for worship. Depending upon the size, the temple may also have a Mahamandapa, principal assembly hall, and an inner ambulatory around the sanctum. Temples with inner ambulatory have balconied windows, possibly to provide a sense of space and light. A few of the large temples follow the Panchayatana layout with subsidiary shrines in the four corners. Small or large, the roofs of all the temples rise majestically from the lowest over the Ardha Mandapa entrance port to the tallest over the Sanctum Sanctorum. All the temples have rooms inside that are interconnected and located either in the east or west segment. The entrance to all temples is through the Ardha Mandapa entrance port that leads to the Mandapa assembly hall. Then comes the Antarala vestibule that is the threshold to the Garbhagraha, the Sanctum Sanctorum. Here the cult image is enshrined for worship.
Depending upon the size, the temple may also have a Mahamandapa, principal assembly hall, and an inner ambulatory around the sanctum. Temples with inner ambulatory have balconied windows, possibly to provide a sense of space and light. A few of the large temples follow the Panchayatana layout with subsidiary shrines in the four corners. The Kajuraho chronology. There is no historical data available about the chronology of Kajuraho temples. Experts, however, have drawn up estimates using dating techniques with reference to the architecture and sculptures of the temples. Based on this data, the temples have been categorized into two groups. One group comprises the temples built earlier, partially with granite and partially with sandstone. These temples include Chausat Yogini Temple, Brahma Temple, Varaha Temple. The second group is comprised of temples built entirely with sandstone. The chronology of the second group begins with Lakshmana Temple, closely followed by Parshvanath Temple, and the Vishwanath temple. The sculptures of the three temples are resplendent with classical flavor. They showcase perfectly proportionate figures and admirable balance. The Chitragupt and Jagadambi temples show progressive honing of mastery and skills as evidenced by their being the most artistic sculptures in Kajuraho. However, art, architecture and sculpture attained its zenith with the Kandariya Mahadev temple, the most evolved of all the Kajuraho temples. It comprises of 84 shikharas or spires. main spire being 116 feet from ground level. The human figures have distinctive physiognomy and are noticeably slender and tall. The temple houses the largest variety of Apsara figures. However, the sculptural tradition is only maintained through the Vamana, and Adinath temples. Apsaras or nymphs here sport the most difficult of poses. It is in the sculptures of the Javari temple that the first signs of decline are noticeable. Bordering on decadence at the Chatrubhuja temple. The figures in these temples are nondescript, totally lacking in effervescence so evident in the former temples.
The last in line is the Duladiyo Temple. The eroticism and mysticism apparent in all the other temples is absolutely lost in this garish and lackluster edifice. Sculptures that speak the language of love. The absolute decline of the Khajuraho dynasty's sculptural supremacy is witnessed in the Duladiyo temple. Nevertheless, Khajuraho even today is a one-of-its-kind monumental testimony of the central Indian love-life culture of the 10th century, with hordes of tourists flocking there year after year from around the world. All it takes is a little flight of imagination to be transported to the days of yore, another lifetime. Keep your ears open. You can actually hear the trumpet of elephants, the sound of hooves of the horses used for royal transport, a woman's giggle as she plays with her pet parrot. The entrancing music emanating from a flute, the magical music created by the strings of the veena. It cannot but Enthrall you. The tinkle of the silver anklets of the nymphs captured for eternity in sublime dance poses. The sound of marching soldiers playing drums, conches, and trumpets. The general on the back of a galloping horse. The majestic elephants parading in the war procession. There is palpable titillation as the eyes feast on the seductive body of a young woman in her see-through skin-hugging sari, a beaded necklace gracing her shapely back.
curiosity to know what the lovelorn lady on the wall might be writing to her beloved, holding a pen and a paper. Such an intent and intense expression on her face. The elegant poise and expressions of the freezes. The mind embarks on a visual journey to that beautiful era where lovemaking was not considered taboo, but was hailed as a celebration. The Art of Lovemaking in the Medieval Era The graceful poise, symmetric balance and abiding beauty of the sculptures of Khajuraho make the act of lovemaking appear erotic and an expression of art. The sculptures seem to exude sensuality, drenched in passionate love. The satiated expressions of the nymphs portraying sensuality and love makes one overcome with admiration and even sexual arousal. The Kajuraho temples abound with erotic and titillating sculptures. From the male undressing his beloved, or the female divesting her clothes herself. The couple entwined in a sweet embrace in each other's arms, locked in a passionate kiss. Not to mention the many sculptures depicting couples indulging in sexual intercourse, with male's organs visibly either inside the female or being held by her. Various unconventional poses are an education in the art of lovemaking. 
lover inside his beloved, his hands around her waist, over her thighs, tightly clasped at her back, carrying her entire weight at his waist, engrossed in passionate lovemaking. The lover on his head, upside down, his legs around the waist of his beloved. The beloved facing her lover, her hands around the necks of standing female attendants on either side, attendants also holding her legs apart, intercourse in full swing. The position changes, with the female now on her head, her legs being held apart by her female attendants, the man now holding the attendants by their necks to stay above the ground, and making love with deeper penetration and more force. There is a depiction of a couple in sweet embrace, their nude bodies intertwined. The female standing on her left leg, her right leg around the waist of her lover. The lover with his left leg on the ground and his right leg around the waist of his beloved. The lovers are so blissfully lost in each other their attendants, though with their backs to them, are visibly aroused, driven to fondling their private parts and masturbating. There are portrayals of the lover sitting on the edge of a seat, with both his legs firmly planted on the ground, holding his beloved by her thighs above his lap, making passionate love to her. There are female attendants on either side to help. One of them fondling herself, suggesting an infectious aura of love. There are some scandalous sculptures present as well, showing oral sex and rear entry. Like the one showing a woman satisfying two men at a time, one with her mouth and the other at her rear. One depicts the female in a bent down position like a dog, providing sexual gratification by rear entry inside her. One shows the couple engaged in the popular oral sex position of 69, satisfying each other. There are other extremely challenging postures as well, like a nude woman hanging upside down over the shoulders of her lover, her body facing away from him, her legs around his neck, her lover pleasuring her with oral sex, and she in turn defying gravity to pleasure her man with oral sex. There are also depictions of coition with animals, like this frieze showing two men seeking sexual pleasure from a mare standing between them. One is already intimate with the mare from behind, while the other seems to be preparing for pleasure from the mare's mouth. Though there are relatively fewer portrayals of man with animals, anal sex and oral sex on the temple walls, their presence is undeniable proof that these are not inventions of the 21st century as is popularly believed by some. These sculptures clearly portray a different picture of Indian society around the 10th century.
As per the travel memoirs of Ibn Battuta, a famous traveler who visited India in 1335 AD, these temples were always crowded by the rich and poor alike during this time. His observant account indicates that Indian society at that time viewed love and sex in different perspectives. A very revealing aspect of these cultures is the dominant role of women in the expressions of love and lovemaking during this era. Role of women in love. An analytical study of the sculptures of Khajuraho reveals the dominant role of woman in ancient Indian society. It also portrays women as being much more than just a means for expressing love. The sculptors depict the beauty, 
poise and massive energy of women in these cultures, giving credence to the fact that 10th century Indian society regarded woman as the finest creation of God. The portrayals eternalize women's deep devotion, giving their all to gratify their lovers, at the same time displaying their total gratification as reflected in their graceful poise and rapturously content facial expressions. It seems that their love transcends everything else. Another very revealing fact depicted in the sculptures of Khajuraho is the equal role of women in the act of lovemaking, with women also seen as initiators and assuming the lead, seducing a lover by disrobing, teasing her lover's beard, divesting her lover of his garments, assuming charge in lovemaking by sitting astride her lover's organ while he lies down under her. All the sculptures reveal how women in the medieval era were much more expressive and uninhibited during the acts of intimacy. A glance from a spiritual lens.
While everyone acknowledges and admires the artistic eroticism displayed on the temple walls of Khajuraho, scholars have endeavoured to perceive these temples from a different plane altogether. Striving to establish a deeper connect, studying the architecture and theme of these temples, revelling in the spiritual aspect of Khajuraho. All the sculptures, erotic and otherwise, seem to convey a far more profound message. They underline the dichotomy of human beings within, a mix of divine and the devil. Man is exposed to temptations of both love and lust. The choice lies entirely with him to attain spiritual freedom or sensual slavery. The myriad of choices man has in life have been portrayed on the outer walls of the temples. These include man's unrestrained appetite for sex. Only those who single-mindedly focus on the determination to attain self-realization are able to transcend the multitude of earthly desires and progress to a spiritual plane. The level of realization is depicted at a higher level on the temple walls showing Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. The three super manifestations of creation, preservation and demolition respectively. As man ascends higher up the levels of the divine plan, the designs of the temple grow more abstract and symbolic. The higher levels of the temple walls have no depictions of the human form or of the gods, just like divinity is formless and without expression. Gradually, the entire structure reaches a pinnacle, which seems to blend into space, a pyramid of life, culminating into the limitless and unabounding beauty and glory of the infinite. Thus, the Kajuraho temples are a depiction of the multi-level journey of man's inward search and discovery to self-realization. Can there be a better example of the understanding of life than this? Indeed, it is a question of the perspective. Kajuraho gives to the beholder what he seeks.